Yeah. So good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, John, just as always, it's first and last name for me, um, and your position, I guess, or former position with and with who? I'm Juwan Armour, uh, former Commissioner of Administrative Services, Program Manager for the Mayor's Initiative to Reduce Gun Violence. Juwan, you know, we just talked about it. There's a lot of speculation out there as to what happened. Did you resign? Were you pushed out? Um, and why? Um, I was definitely not pushed out. Uh, it's not, I don't get pushed out of anywhere. Um, I, I resigned. Um, I think the, the lift would be a little bit more easier from this side of the fence. Um, you know, um, the goal is to, is to create change, right? The goal is to create an atmosphere of safety. Um, and without promoting, you know, success, um, it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to get individuals to change what um, the negativities that they see, that's more promoted um, to them in the community. Um, but to just create an atmosphere of hope. Um, and so with that, you know, again, we're trying to change the mindset of not only young people, but adults. And, and any, in that effort regarding changing that attitude, you know, if, if, if you can't sell fear, you have to sell hope and, and optimism. And so, you know, um, messaging is a part of that. And so um, I just found it difficult to have a, a, a culturally competent message, um, a standard set. And so, you know, I, I'll continue to work. I'll just do it from a different vantage point. You know, sometimes uh, some of the people in the community, they you know, they were speculating that perhaps you had resigned because you were not getting paid enough or because you weren't getting the backing from the mayor or whatnot. What is your tr actual true reasoning that you resigned? Um, just the barriers, just the barriers of um, political government um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a, a variety of issues, but more so just to, um, I feel that it's just more accepted, right? I, I didn't take the position for the money. Um, I didn't take the position for the notoriety or the publicity. I took the position to create change. I know how funding works. And if, if there's an effort to address gun violence, um, if numbers aren't put out, then that effort will be stopped. And it'll be an excuse of what well, we tried. Um, with the lives that are impacted by gun violence, I don't, I don't stopping is not an issue. So I, I took the responsibility, um, having full confidence that we could create success. And, and I'm thankful that's what we've been able to show with the numbers that we've seen from our first phase. Talk to me about that first phase that you were involved in um, and those numbers, those graphs that you sent me. Yeah, so originally um, the plan was to build out in each community simultaneously uh, with the direction of cure violence. These communities are too large. Um, so the initial um, concept was to build out in one community before moving to others. So uh, in our first community, Junction and Inglewood, um, it consists of about 7,800 people, close to 8,000 people. And so um, with that, um, to build out in that neighborhood, then move on to LaGrange Corridor, and then move on to the Garfield Star area on the east side. Talk to me about the numbers that you saw. Was the program successful in your eyes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are trying to reduce homicides, and that's exactly what we've been able to show. Not only did we reduce homicides in those areas, but we, we reduced crime and violent crime in those areas. Um, and I think it would be irresponsible to say if it was, it was just this particular program. It was the efforts that, you know, a multiple, um, a multiple agencies participate in, Junction Coalition, um, TPS schools um, under the direction of uh, Principal Ward and Dr. Jones, who I worked very closely with. Um, it's, it's a multitude of agencies that helped out to create this atmosphere, but it's just that. It's just being able to partner and collaborate together and work together for a common cause is how we were able to, you know, see the numbers that we saw from last year. And with that said, you know, do you think that you had enough support from the city? You know, I don't think there ever be enough support. You know, I, um, yeah, I, I think the, the, the effort definitely could have been supported more. Um, I'm thankful for the support I did get. Um, I'm thankful for the numbers we were able to create. Uh, but, you know, I definitely feel more could have been done. Uh, but again, we, we, it, it was a successful year. And I don't want to minimize the lives that were lost. Our three incidents with Natasha Carlisle, uh, Laura Lucky, and young Jalen Pryor, all tragic. Um, um, but we have, to, we have to show success in a program um, so that we can encourage, encourage the community that change is possible. Do you think that you had enough backing from the mayor? Yeah, I'm, I don't want to answer that one. It's not one I feel comfortable answering. Um, 
what would it have taken, I guess, for you to be able to say that you were supported, you know, more guidance from city council, from the mayor, what would it have taken maybe for you to feel that you were fully backed? Um, honestly, when issues arose, um, that they were addressed immediately. You know, um, I know this is city government, we're dealing with taxpayer dollars and, you know, there is a process. Um, and sometimes that process is just a part of it. Um, but with that, you know, um, violence doesn't stop, violence doesn't wait. And so, you know, a lot of it was the bureaucracy of politics, which is, is, is the natural animal, which it is. Um, but some of it, I think, you know, we could have alleviated and kind of expedited the process in a, in a number of ways, moving on to our next community, um, putting programming together in efficient time to address needs, um, I think are some of the things that could have been expedited to get the ball rolling. Um, but you know, it, it is what it is. I was out there the other day in that Inglewood, the Junction Inglewood area, and um, you know one of the community members there. He said, uh, you know, why he thought you were probably leaving was uh, that they weren't paying you enough. How many paychecks were you able to get? Were you? Do you think that the position that you had and the responsibility that you were being paid enough, or do you think it's something that probably needs to be looked at for that future person? Um. You know, the, the pay wasn't, a, wasn't an issue for me because um, that wasn't the focus at the time. But I think for somebody to commit their time to this, to this initiative and to dedicate the hours that it needs, I think the pay would absolutely have to be more. Um, but that wasn't, you know, that's, that wasn't my motivating factor. Uh, and so the pay was irrelevant. You know, the, 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 the cause was definitely outweighed the pay. Um, I, I'm, in a, I'm in a fortunate position, you know, in life. Um, I'm in a very fortunate position. And so, you know, but for somebody to dedicate, you know, 12, 14 hours some days, uh, I was just able to do it, you know, with my, my kids being in Columbus and me being here, and you know, I, was, I was able to do it. And I knew that, right? I knew the commitment that it would take. You know, I asked my kids permission. I asked my fiance's permission before I came down. Everybody was on one accord. We were all in agreement. And so I knew the time commitment. I knew that I would be here, um, six to seven, five to six days a week. I knew the hours would be 12 to 14 hours a day. And it was just, you know, my steps were pretty much ordered by God. I had just left a position with the University of Toledo. Um, quality Assurance was the same calendar, 14, 16 hours a day. And so I was kind of prepared for what, um, what was needed. Um, but more so the, the cause was the motivating factor. And you know, one of the things that we heard from the city was that you were leaving because of your family, because you wanted, is that a big part of why you're leaving or is it a combination of different things? It's a combination of different things. Um, you know, one, I, I take, you know, my mental health very seriously. I take, you know, what I surround myself with and the environment I surround myself with very seriously. Um, and if the environment is not healthy to, to, you know, if I'm not right, nobody's right. That's, I, I firmly believe that. And so, you know, if the environment isn't supporting or isn't ideal for me and my growth, as well as being um, that I can be more effective for the community, then I easily remove myself and continue on. Uh, you know, do you think that there was a child out there, a parent, a grandparent that you touched? Or do you have a story to share of maybe someone that maybe you, you saved a child or you, you, you uh, supported that parent? Can you tell me about one of those instances maybe? Um, yeah, this is, uh, so after Jalen's passing, um, um, a friend of mine wanted to get a bunch of his loved one, not family, but his friends, people that associated with him together, just to make sure that, you know, at the, at, when we have the funeral, which was, was the following day, is that, you know, let's let the mom and dad put their child to rest, let it be peace, um, and just trying to, you know, understand some of the underlying issues that this particular group was experiencing. And so we're having a conversation. Uh, it started about seven o'clock. It went on to about 1030, took some food over there. We eat just a good conversation. In this house, it's about 15 to 20 kids, not kids, but raising ages ranging from 14 to 22, 23. And so in this conversation, um, you know, there's a lot of hopelessness. Like even the ones that felt they would want to change the direction they're moving in, the question becomes, well, if I change, who says that you know, the person I'm beefing with is going to accept that. And so it was just a, a, a lot was learned from me um, on, on my behalf on, on why some people feel stuck in their circumstances. So after that conversation, um, I go out to get in my car. Um, Mom go out, goes and get her car. She leave. Um, so as I'm sitting there 
one of the guys come out of the house and he's sitting in the car with me and he's telling me, you know, don't give up, you know, uh, they hear you just when certain people come into the conversation, they get quiet, there could be intimidation, it could be a lot of things, right? And so as we're having this conversation, a car pulls up uh, their tail lights to my tail lights, right? A guy jumps out of the driver's seat, guy jumps out of the back passenger seat, and a guy stands up on the passenger side, I can see him on my rear view, and they start shooting at a house, two houses down from where I was at, right? So I'm, I slide down the chair, I'm watching out of my rear view. The brother that was in my passenger seat, he, we, he's 22. And, and, and I don't know if it's um, just the normalization of violence, but we continue the conversation, right? We continue the conversation. He's trying to get a job. I'm trying to figure out how I can help him get a job. The shooting lasted for about 12 to 15 seconds. Um, and while they're shooting the house we just left out, the, the guys come out. You know, when I was when I was that age, you know, we I've been, I'm from Avondale, 1600 block all my life, and we're accustomed to hearing gunshots. And we know the first thing you do is get on the ground. When the gunshots over, the first thing you do is check yourself to make sure you haven't been hit. Where nowadays the culture is embrace that, come out fearless. You know what I mean? And it just really it was really eye opening how fast young people are to just embrace death. You know that and, and it's scary, right? But in that conversation piece, it was just awesome to know that, you know, after that, after that conversation, I told him I'll be back. You know what I mean? That it doesn't stop anything, but he knew, you know what I mean? And it was just that, that um, sense of um, this is one potential person who understands, right? He understands that a lot of time our circumstances dictate our behavior, but it doesn't necessarily always have to be that way, right? But just having that conversation with him in, in, in an effort to not not only he's walking the right path, but in an effort to get his little brothers to follow that path and encourage, despite gunfire being outside our car, despite the environment we're in, he was hopeful that you know change change can come. And so you know it's things like that 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 you know that continues to work and, and, and you know how how needed the work is and and there's just a disconnect it's just a disconnect so if we can find a way to fill that void and 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 show young people show older people show anybody who is who suffers from any of these social deterrence that change is possible you know it'll be it's tremendous but we you you'll never you'll never see that if we don't promote success um Right now, you know, you're talking about that success. You know, you told me last time you're not just going to leave and forget about everything happening here. How are you involved now and how will you be involved, you know, with this initiative moving forward? So my, my relationships were, were most of the programming that took place, about 14 to 15 programs, all uh, existed based on previous relationships I already had with individuals that I've worked with in prevention before. Um, Rachel Hanna Yes program, which employs young people over the summer. Outstanding program. Rachel does an amazing job with the uh, CCMEP dollars. Um, um, I lost my train of thought. Uh, Ernie Banks at Stand Up Man Up is partnering with Tanya Duran to do a Midnight Basketball League, another outstanding program. Alan Richardson, All In Academy. You know, I can go on and on in these different programs, these various programs that are taking place. And these programs, these collaborations that were made weren't based on my title as um, program manager for the city. These relationships were based on previous relationships that I already had. My relationship with Dr. Durant um, and Carrie Sarabia and their restorative process when individuals are suspended from school, instead of just bringing in into school, let's have a restorative process so we can understand the decisions they made to get suspended. And then working with Angie Hayes from StaffWorks, if, if you are not resuspended, you get an opportunity to choose what job you want to do for this summer. And so you, you incentivize individuals based on their, their progress and their improvement. And these partnerships with all of these three entities I'm sharing with you were relationships that I already had, right? And so it's just bringing people to the table and connecting the dots, because um, I don't provide direct services to anyone, but being able to partner and collaborate and not work in silos and be able to share information and be transparent is how we'll create change. And you plan to continue those relationships. Absolutely, is, is absolutely. What, Again, you know, these are, these are, these are, you know, Ernie Banks was my first counselor when I was dealing with anger management issues. You know, I, these individuals, a lot of them that I partner with, Tanya Duran, I've known all my life. I, I love these people, you know what I mean? And so it's my responsibility to make it hard for them to fail. Not that they will, but just try to eliminate as many barriers as I can to help them move forward. And hopefully, um, 
you know, people will come out. I, I read a, 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 I read the article from um, Reverend Perryman when he talked about doing the work outside of the castle. It, it, it's in the truth. It's an amazing piece, and he's exactly right. We do the work out here. Hopefully, we'll knock down those borders and those those barriers, and more people from inside will come outside and contribute to the cause. Okay. Um. I think this is a conversation we had before, you know, were there any misconceptions about your position, you know, what people wanted your position to be versus what you were able, you know, what your position was to you, you know, or what mm -hmm. your role was? Yeah, I, I think the expectations, you know, they vary. People not understanding what the model of cure violence entailed, people not understanding what my role was, um, individuals from the community not understanding that we are only in Junction and Inglewood, these communities in phase one. Phase two, we're in LaGrange Corridor. Phase three, we're in Garfield Star on the east side. The, 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 we wanted to be intentional and strategic in attacking gun violence. But when, a, when if people aren't understanding that message, if a, if a shooting happens in Oregon, they ask them, well, where are the violence interrupters at? A shooting happens in Maumee, where the violence, but that's not where we are. You know, that's not a part of the plan or the process. And no fault of those individuals, but it's just an error in communication. It's very similar, you know, TPD had an issue with me coming on prior to, and I think if they would have been brought in at the very beginning, it would have made that, that, um, that implementation, it would have made the implementation a lot smoother. And, and you know, but I'm thankful they were, they've been outstanding, Captain Hefferman, um, my liaison with TPD has been amazing. Uh, Lieutenant Trevino, who oversees the community service officers, has been very supportive. Um, and so, you know, it's just been, it's been very refreshing, honestly, um, especially from some, someone who's had so many issues with law enforcement in the past, to, to work and partner for the common good and see officers and talk and meet with officers who really care, you know what I mean? And because the, the perception is that most don't. But that's not necessarily what we could potentially see here in Toledo because that's what we're seeing all around the world. So we have a very unique opportunity here. And, and as, as part of things from the community um, that was identified, um, they want to build relationships with law enforcement as well. So, you know, we're working to do that um, in, our, in our committees. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that process. I really am. Um, what advice would you have to that next person that fills your shoes? How do you think that they could be successful? That, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, honestly, rely on your partnerships, rely on the community, because um, change is gonna come from within. Um, when, 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 when dollars fall short um, and, and budgets fall to pieces, um, there's gonna be those relationships that are able to create programming and not only create that programming as effective, but make sure that programming is sustainable for a long period of time. And in that implementation that, you know, cultural competence is, is ingrained in there, sustainability is ingrained in there, equity is ingrained in there. And so um, definitely um, be conscious of the community and the needs of the community. And the way people want to help you may not be the need that, may not be the help that you need. And so just be conscious in addressing the issues and the needs. You know, for you, it was very important, you know, to show or to give us those graphs that you gave us to show that um, this program was making a difference. Talk to me about th that and, and, you know, that, that um, hopelessness as well. You know, so if people don't see a change or people are not actually seeing, you know, the numbers, then they think it's not working. So they're like, so they don't care. I yeah, guess. yeah, absolutely. So. You know, in prevention, the goal is to promote awareness, right? The, the goal is to promote optimism and hope um, and things of that nature. Um, a lot of people, you know, they, they you guys excuse my language, but they, kind of, they prostitute the community out, right? I'll give you an example. There's people that could potentially be running for office. They'll, they'll jog in the community just to be visible. Any marginalized community, if they feel that they're getting any kind of attention, they believe that person cares about them. Very similar to which I learned from L. Uh, an advocate for sex trafficking, she educated me a lot on this. Young ladies are groomed when they aren't getting attention at home. So when, as soon as you show them that attention that they're not getting, they think that you care. Very similar to our community. Just because the individual jogs in our community and, and a, a stand and listen to you don't mean that they care about the community. Just because an individual runs for city council on a platform to address gun violence don't mean they have a plan to address gun violence or that plan even includes the community. Right. And so I just I just would like our community to be conscious um, of individuals that sell fear as opposed to selling hope. 
You know, we, we've seen it. We've seen caskets on door in Detroit. We've seen people do press conferences on the sites where two young women pass to promote a youth program that has nothing to do with the incident that just took place the night before. And I think it's ir irresponsible. And so um, with that, um, I just would encourage everybody to, to just promote hope. And, and the more you promote hope, um, you, pr you promote volunteerism, you promote individuals to, be, to participate in events, knowing that their, their effort could create change. Because what happens when a person isn't scared anymore? If they're not worried about that fear, then what? But you can always be hopeful. You can always hope for better, no matter what your circumstances are. And so, you know, I just, um, I really um, would just like the community to, to acknowledge and just be confident that change is coming, because it is, and we've shown that. And if we can have the same effect in the first community and our next two communities, um, we'll, we'll reduce gun violence tremendously um, in, in, in the city as a whole. One other thing that, you know, all the community members that I've talked to, uh, and one even told me this at the Junction Inglewood area, she said, her question for you would be, how do they keep this going? How do they keep this momentum going? How do they make this a long-term plan? What would your advice to them be? Um, I, I say, uh, you know, it, it'll be, it'll be, individuals will be hard pressed to stop this program, right? When gun violence is going up in our city, gun violence is going up all over the world, individuals, we can't find ways to get it to go down. In this small pocket, these two communities of Inglewood and Junction, we found a way for it to go down. And so I, I would just promote that, if, if, if I would promote that success, right? Um, I'll give you an example, the African American Wellness Walk. Um, I bring 20, 30 people to that walk every year, not to walk, but just to take part in the free medical services, the dental services, and these people have insurance, but it's just those numbers, right? Because if they, if, if they provide these services to our community and nobody shows, then they're gonna stop them, right? So I would just encourage people to participate, be seen, be vocal, um, and be knowledgeable about what's going on in the community um, because change is definitely possible and we've shown that. And so I, I'm 110% I'm, I'm confident that Chief Bird and Angel will have the same success in our next two communities. Um, they are from the community um, and they are passionate about you know, what they want to achieve. And I'm, I'm here to support them in whatever way I can. So you'll stay in contact with them as far as hiring a new person or perhaps um you know, I know they said something about restructuring the program if they needed to. Right. That's that. You know, that's not. That's completely not up to me. Whatever they would have me do, I'll be happy to help out. Um, my goal right now um, is to make sure all the programming that was created is successful. That's my goal. Perfect. Anything else, Dad? Anything that I didn't ask you that you think would be good? Um, I would like to thank the Tesla Football League for welcoming me on. Um, I, that was huge. I wanted to get a, a, a football league started. Um, the reason being is that um, football has the largest capacity of, of black youth, right? Black boys, right? And to, and which are the same population of kids and young people who are the most affected by gun violence. And so if we can um, incorporate a number of uh, decision-making tools, a number of uh, social emotional learning techniques, um, into that culture, you know, that'll be tremendous for that population of young people and their parents and families. And so, and at the same time, they're enjoying the process. And so I wanted to start my own football league through the city. Um, it didn't work out, but Tesla uh, welcomed me in to help them in their program. And I'm excited. I'm extremely excited to see what we can do this year. What's next for you? Um, right now, um, looking for a job. I'm looking for a job. But right now, I'm also, again, I just want to make sure our programs are sustainable. I'm looking forward to get back into high school coaching. Uh, so I have a lot going on. But again, I'm just excited about, you know, continuing the effort. I'm excited what Reggie Williams has going on there over at the Doug. You know, I've been going to the Douglas Center since I was eight. And so uh, there, there's a lot of positive, um, and that's where I'm focused on in Toledo and in my personal life.